Good morning, church. Listen, guys, you know that we're in the midst of our sermon series, Living in the Red. We're looking at the red letter words of Jesus the entire year. Uh, again, not getting to, to know about Jesus as much as we are getting to know him, to really know who he is. And we're on the basis of this. We're, we're in our first seven weeks. Uh, we're looking at the foundation of Jesus. This is a, these are the foundational statements that Jesus makes about who he is. And we've already seen that, that Jesus is the Messiah. We've already seen that Jesus is eternal. We've seen that Jesus is God. And today we look at this, this fact that Jesus is Savior. And it actually comes at the end of an odd text that we find in Matthew chapter 11. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 11. We'll start in just a few moments. If you have your Bible like me, go to the New Testament. First book, Matthew, trying to keep it easy, chapter 11. Guys, if you have your smartphones, tablets, iPads, go ahead and open up your Bible apps to Matthew chapter 11. And we're going to start reading in just a moment. But first, I want to give you some background as to what's going on in the text. Because I said, it, it, the text that we look at today kind of comes off the heels of, uh, of an odd text. And it's an odd text because we have some that we think are in, but they're actually out. And we have some that, that, that we think that are out, but they're actually in. And so, so it flips, it's, it's like a flip-flop. And so we're going to see that when we get there because the whole entire process, the, the whole entire thrust of, of the message today is coming from a, a, uh, a discussion that Jesus has with the people. And, and it's a tough talk. And I, I know, guys, you, I keep coming up here, I, I keep saying Jesus has a tough talk, and he does, whether it's with his disciples or the religious leaders, uh, whoever it may be. Today, it's just some people around a certain area, some certain towns. And guys, look, here's the deal. When we, when we encounter Jesus... And when we really see him for who he is, there are tough talks that come from that. Those are good talks. Today Jesus has one of those tough talks and he begins by saying, he begins by saying, woe to you. Now, you know you're in trouble when the first thing Jesus says to you is woe to you. I mean, guys, just think about your wives. If they say woe to you, you know you're already in trouble. And so, so this is what's going on there. Okay, now, now to, to get some understanding of the background, Jesus is... At this particular point in the suburbs of Capernaum. Capernaum is where he has his, his home base for his Galilean ministry. This is, this is honestly an area where the people were very blessed. Very, very blessed. Very privileged because Jesus' presence was in that area more than he was anywhere else. And they saw his miracles more than anyone else. For example, this is where he healed the nobleman's son. This is where he healed the centurion's servants. Uh, where he healed uh, two blind men. Um, two demoniacs, the, the paralytic. He, he healed the, the woman who'd been bleeding for 12 years. He healed Jairus' daughter, Peter's mother-in-law, This is and dozens of others. This is a place where he really did his miracles. They were privileged to that. And you think if anybody, if any people group would, would be able to respond to that, it would be these guys. But they didn't. They rejected Jesus. And so when Jesus is standing there, he's talking to the people of these nearby towns, and he says, here's the deal, woe to you, right, to start off with, and then he says, here's the deal. Guys, look, at, if I would have done, if I'd have done these miracles in other places, it would have been better for them than it would be for you. He, he uses cities like Tyre and Sidon and, and Sodom, and he says, if I'd have performed these miracles in those cities, It'd been better, it, 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 trust me, it'd be better for them on the day of judgment than for you guys. Because they would have repented. He, he says specifically, Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented. And in fact, to, to the point of sackcloth and ashes. Now again, we don't understand 100% what that is. But think of, uh, think of like a burlap bag, okay? Because <laughs> they're not very fashionable. But, but that would be sackcloth. I and mean, they would take ashes from a fire pit. And they would just smear it all over their face. That, it was a pathetic look, but, but that was the idea. See, there was repentance. And then there was repentance with sackcloth, sackcloth and ashes. And it was just a deeper repentance. It was showing, this is what's going on on the inside of me. And so he's saying, if I'd have done these miracles there, they would have repented to the utmost point of repentance. And they would have understood that. They also would have stood, understood the idea of, of Tyre and Sidon. Now, we don't really know what that is. You, you wonder, is that, is that south of Albuquerque? Or, you know, we, we don't know 100%. You know, because, we're, again, we're, we're removed 2,000 years. The audience would have got it. Tyre and Sidon were the epitome 
of, of God's enemies. When you thought of God's enemies, you thought of Tyre and Sidon. When you thought of Tyre and Sidon, you thought of God's enemies. And to say Sodom, that was the epitome of sin. And so he's saying, here's the deal. It's going to be better for those guys on Judgment Day than for you guys. And Capernaum, you think you're going to be lifted to the heavens? Here's the deal. You're going to be brought down to the depths, down to Hades. And that, that Greek word there, that means hell. Jesus is saying, here's the deal. They're out. Ha. Yeah, as in you, all of you, they're out, right? That's, they're out. We think they're in, but they're not. They're out, and these other guys are in. And Jesus says, here's the deal, guys. If I had performed these miracles in other places, they would have repented because you didn't repent. And you know, you think you're going to be lifted to heaven, but you are going to hell. Whew. So that is, a, that is a tough talk. Any way you slice it, that is tough. Where Jesus comes out and says, woe to you, and finishes with, you're going to hell. And so you wonder what the people did that was so wrong. And, and, and I, can, I can answer that in one word. They were indifferent. You see, they, they, they didn't push Jesus away, and they didn't try to kill Jesus. They were just indifferent. They just rejected his message. They heard what he said. They saw what he did, and they rejected and so essentially what's happening is Jesus is going out for a while. He, he's leaving. He's doing these miraculous things and these great sermons and healings. And, and all of this stuff, is all this information is coming back. And when he gets back, he sees that the people haven't changed a bit. Not, not a single bit of change. No repentance. They're still doing the same old things that they've always been doing. And Jesus... In my opinion, this, this is Ray. This is not Bible. In my opinion, Jesus is frustrated. And he's saying, guys, look, you're over here trying to keep all the 613 rules of law. It's not going to happen. It's wearing you down. It's a burden that you can't handle because it's not going to save you. It's old. It's busted. It's broken. And you need to get out of that because that's old. And over here where I'm at, this is the new. You see, you think about, think about the first giving of the law back in the book of Exodus. Remember when Moses comes down the mountain and he's got the, the tablets with him with the Ten Commandments and remember he comes down the mountain and what did he see the other side of the mountain? <laughs> I'm sorry. He goes, comes down the mountain and, and what does he see? He sees the Israelites were, were dancing around at this, this golden calf that was created, this idol, this image of gold and remember 3,000 people are struck dead immediately. First giving of the law, 3,000 people died. You compare that to the first giving of the gospel message of Jesus Christ in Acts chapter 2 where Peter preaches on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people saved. 3,000 people added to the church. So the law doesn't save. Only Jesus saves. And he's trying to get that through to them. And I can, I can pick up on the frustration with everything that's going on with all that he's saying to these guys. Guys, look, if you would just repent, if you would just get away from the old and come into the new, there's life over here. There's salvation over here. Now, at first glance, it really looks like we, we have a ticked off Jesus. I, I mean, honestly, at first glance, it seems like we, we have a, a, a super, super angry Savior. But as we dig through the text a little bit more, guys, what we see is, is we don't have this, this angry Savior over here so much as we have this sorrowful Savior. So he's not filled with anger so much as he is, he's filled with sorrow. Because in the midst of, of that tough talk, uh, of that discussion with those people, in the midst of everything that he said, he, he still comes down to giving them the most beautiful invitation that he could ever offer. And I'm sure you guys know it. I'm sure you've heard it. You've read it probably a hundred times or so. Let's read it a, a hundred and five uh, more. How about that? Another five times or so today. We find it in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28. And this is what Jesus says. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Guys, what a, what a great invitation. What a, what a beautiful invitation that is. For, for a people that, that are worn and they're weary and they're trying to, to just make life over here. And they're just not getting it because the law doesn't save. And Jesus steps in and he says, guys, just come to me. Come to me. Again, a, a beautiful invitation. It must have felt like, like the eye of a storm. You, you know, where, where there's, there's peace and there's tranquility there, but it's surrounded by turmoil. He, even, even in the midst of Jesus rejecting them, but he still comes out and says, guys, here's the deal. Come to me, all who are weary, all of you 
who are weary and burdened. And guys, I, I want you to notice, he doesn't say some of you. He doesn't say, you guys over there, or, oh, hey, you guys in the back. He doesn't say that. He says, all of you who are weary and burdened. And guys, I say that because, look, I, I, I know how it goes. There, there are a hundred of us in this room today. One percent is one person. And if there's one person in here today that can relate to, to what I'm going to share here in a moment, I, I want you to really pay attention, okay? Because I... I, I say all. Jesus says all because he means it. And here, here's the deal with that. I knew this young woman many years ago. And she had, as we would say, she had a heart of gold. She, she would pray for anybody, anybody who had a need. Oh, man, she was right there to, to, to help, to do whatever she needed to do. And, and she just, she had that heart. She was a prayer warrior. She would pray and pray and pray for others. She wouldn't pray for herself. She, she didn't feel worthy. And so we had many discussions, and she finally understood, she finally understood that, that she has value in God's eyes, that she has meaning, that she has purpose, and that she, she is worthy to come before the Lord and to share what's on her heart and to give that to Him. And guys, maybe you can understand what I'm saying. Maybe some of you here today, you know what I mean, where, where you don't feel worthy. Maybe you pray for others, but, but you don't feel worthy to, to pray for yourself. And I want you to know this. I want you to know that you do have value. You have worth. You're made in the image of God's eyes. You're, excuse me, made in the image of God. And in God's eyes, you have value. You have worth and purpose. And he loves you guys. And he gives you the same invitation. Whatever you're dealing with, whatever you're struggling with, he, he says, give that to me. And I will give you rest. You see, it's, it's not about our burdens. It's about his grace. When he says, he says, come to me. All who are weary and burdened. He's saying this, give, give me your brokenness. Give me your loneliness. Give, give me your sinfulness. And in exchange, I will give you love and grace and peace and life. So he says, come, give me what you've got. Give me your worst, and I will give you rest. Guys, you know there are ways that we can, we can burden ourselves. There are ways that we can become weary and burdened simply because of choices we make, simply because of the, the things that we do, the way we think, uh, the way we act, the way we talk. And this morning, I want to share with you very, very briefly six ways in which we can weary ourselves, which we can burden ourselves. And I, I know it's, it's not an exhaustive list. It's only six things in here. But I honestly believe that, that all six of these items are going to cover every single one of us in here. And, and you'll be able to relate every single one of us, okay? And so the first two that I want to talk about are guilt and shame. Guilt is the feeling that, that we've done something wrong. And let me tell you, if, if there's anything good about guilt, I really believe it's a Holy Spirit thing. I really do, because I really feel like uh, uh, we, we do something wrong, and then we feel guilty, and that's really the Holy Spirit's way of saying, hey, man, hey, hey, wake up, dude, because what you just did was, was not a good thing. And so if there's any good to it, I would say that's good for sure. But, but of course, you know that I want to talk about the, the negative, the, the, the other guilt, the guilt that we carry around because of something we did five years ago. 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and we carry this guilt of something that we did or we didn't do, or, or, or something we said or that we didn't say, and we just carry that with us over the years, and what it does is it wears us down, and it wearies us. It's a burden, guys, and, and, and usually it's stuff that we, we can't fix. That, that's the issue. It's, it's like if you can fix it, fix it. If you can't, don't worry about it. In fact, the Bible says that we can't even add another day to our lives by worry. So, so don't worry. And uh, excuse me, worry because of, of guilt, right? We, we think about that worry. I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit already this morning. But, but we, with guilt, you know, we, we worry about things. We, we drag those things with us. It's, it's just constant. And guilt can wear us down and weigh us down. And look, here's the deal. If you, don't, if you don't surrender that to Jesus, guilt turns into shame. Shame is the feeling that, that we don't measure up. You look back into the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit, the first thing they felt was guilt. 
But then when they start to look, to, they looked at themselves, they, they felt shame. And remember what they did? They hid themselves and they ran and they hid from God. And you think, boy, what a stupid thing to do. But guys, that's what shame does. Shame, shame will, will shut us down and it will cause us to, to draw back and we'll hide from God, we'll hide from others because shame can be devastating for us. But you don't have to have that. You don't have to live with that. Jesus says, give me, give me your guilt, give me your shame and, and in return, I will give you rest. But guys, there's also worry and anxiety. I was getting getting ahead of myself real quick there. I was getting ahead of myself. But worry and anxiety. Worry is this um, concern. It's a deep concern over specific things in our lives. And here's the deal with worry. Because now I'm caught up to where I was. The deal with worry is that it usually is something that we can't fix. And so, and so the deal is if you can fix it, fix it. And if you can't, don't worry about it. Again, don't, don't think of a, a don't worry, be happy. That, that's not what I'm talking about. Well, what I'm talking about is, is don't worry. Give it to God and let him meet your needs. Let him provide as only he can do. Because when you don't check worry, worry turns into anxiety. So if worry is, is deep concern over specific things, then anxiety is a, is a worry over non-specific things. Basically, a worry over everything. Anxiety can be debilitating. Guys, listen, more than 40 million Americans deal with anxiety. They suffer from some form of anxiety today. It is the number one mental health issue in the United States, and it doesn't discriminate by age or race or, or religion or anything. Guys, it just doesn't. It, it can be devastating. You know, I think about the guy who swallowed a spoon. And he went to his doctor, and his doctor said, you're going to be okay. Just sit down and don't stir. <laughs> And while that sounds a little bit silly, there's, there's some good advice in that, guys. Don't stir about all the things that are going on in your life. Seriously, just give those to God. The Bible says be anxious about nothing. And so give, give those concerns to God. Give, give those worries to God and let him take those. Because listen, Jesus says, here's the deal, guys. If, if you have worry and anxiety, give me that and I will give you rest. But then we have also fear and dread. This is kind of fear for all things. I mean, there are rational fears. For example, there's a, I, I'm, I'm afraid of snakes. I think that's a rational fear. I, I, I can see how it could become irrational if, if I go crazy with it. But I think it's a healthy, rational fear. For example, there's, there's an island called Snake Island. Now, it's not called Snake Island because it's filled with giraffes. It, it, it's filled with snakes. Literally thousands and thousands of snakes. My daughter saw a picture of just one bush on Snake Island, and it must have had, she said it must have had 100 snakes in it. I'm like, no, 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 that is not me. I don't want to go there. So, so that's, that's a rational, understandable fear. But let me ask you this. What, what do you think, what, what's the number one fear in the United States today? It, it's what I'm doing right now. It's public speaking. Which is kind of understandable, but, but look, look, out of the top ten, death is the number five fear. And loneliness is the number seven fear. Now what that tells me is that there are some people who, who would rather die alone and lonely than to speak in the public. And guys, it just doesn't make sense to me. I'm not saying what I'm doing is easy, because it's not necessarily easy. But, but look, I... I would rather stand in front of a crowd and speak and even make a fool out of myself and be embarrassed to no end rather than to die or to die alone. See how, see how fear can, can kind of creep in and when it does the things like that, it, it gives us this, this irrational thoughts and irrational thoughts lead to irrational actions. And fear, fear can shut you down. It can shut you down, it can keep you from church, keep you from going to your jobs, keep you from talking to people. People, it can keep you from living life. And Jesus says, you don't have to have fear. Give me your fear. Guys, give me your fear, and, and I will give you rest. But then he goes on to say this, Matthew 11, verse 29. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Guys, it's surprising how many Christians don't seem to learn from Jesus. I, I'm not just being serious. I, I know certain people who, who uh, they, they say they've been Christian for 15 years. And honestly, they've really been a Christian one year, 
And they've just repeated that year 15 times. Because I have spoken with this one particular individual, and I won't mention names. They're not here. It's in a different state, so you're okay. But this particular person grew up in their youth group. And this person did not know. It went from youth group to um, college-age classes and then regular into church. And like I said, for 15 years. But this person has no idea about some of the basics of the Bible. So some of the basics of the story, story with Noah and the flood, uh, just details in there that this person just didn't understand, just didn't even know existed. Uh, this person asked me, P Peter was, or Paul, excuse me, Paul, Paul was, was in the Bible, right? So, I mean, just, just saying 15 years, my goodness. And then it boggles my mind because, look, a Christian, by definition, is a follower of Jesus Christ. A follower of Jesus Christ is a disciple of Jesus. A disciple, by definition, is a learner. That is one who learns. And so to be a Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ, a disciple of Jesus Christ, you have to be learning. And so you think about all the things that we learn. In fact, Jesus says, take my yoke and learn from me. Now, that, that can be applied in two ways, and his audience would have got it 100%. Uh, again, you're talking to about an audience that, that understands a lot of the references that Jesus makes. We're, we're removed 2,000 years. It's difficult. It's a different culture. And, you know, and I don't have proof, but I really believe Jesus was, was a visual teacher. I really do. I, I really believe he could point over somewhere and say, guys, look, see, see the farmer over there? There once was a farmer who was sowing seed. You know, I, I could see that. Or, guys, look at the shepherd over there. You know, I, I'm the good shepherd. In fact, we're going to talk about that next week. But, but just even be able to look over and say, guys, see, look, at, look at those horses over there. You see that? Oh, they yoke together. Take, take my yoke. And so in the one sense, Jesus is saying, be yoked with me. This, this was something that, uh, that farmers would do. They would yoke together animals uh, such as uh, horses or ox or, or or even donkeys, and so let's just use a horse as an example. Okay, so so you got this horse, right? And a horse is a horse, of course, of course. So you, so you got this horse. You got Mr. Ed, and he's he's an experienced, seasoned horse. He's been with the farmer a couple of years. He understands the commands and everything from the farmer. So they take that horse and put him with a new horse. And so the new horse is coming in to learn from the, from the seasoned horse. Learns when to start, when to stop, when to turn, all of those good things. And Jesus is saying, do that with me. Be, be yoked with me. And it's, it's this concept of, of walking together. It's a partnership. And he says, be yoked with me. Walk, do life with me. But, but the second part of that, because that's kind of the, the first part that would have totally understood as, as a visual being yoked with a board being yoked with Jesus. But the second part was, um, is also used as a metaphor for uh, subjection to a teacher or, or to a master, to a rabbi. And Jesus is saying, do that with me. Partner with me and let me lead you in a physical sense in your life and in a spiritual sense. Be yoked with me and learn from me. And guys, the things that we learn from Jesus, we can't learn anywhere else. I mean, I'm sure we, we can get a little bit of how to love from certain other people, but guys, not to the depth that Jesus teaches. And think about grace and forgiveness, unity, understanding, patience, peacefulness, justice, mercy. Guys, there's so much that we can learn from Jesus. And he says, guys, be partnered with me and learn from me. We, we don't teach him anything, but he teaches us. He says, learn from me. Learn from me, and I will give you rest. Best for your souls. Jesus is saying, whatever is around your neck, whatever yoke you have, throw it away. Just, just toss it and be yoked with me. Partner with me. And then verse 30, he says this, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He, and he sees, when he says it's easy, he, he, he doesn't mean that, that it's super, super simple. In fact, that, that word there, that Greek word means, means fitting. And he's really saying, my yoke is fitting. That is, it's not a one size fits all, but it will fit you. I know you. I know you better than you know yourself. And this will fit. This is perfect. This is a perfect fit. You and I in a partnership. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Guys, we have so many burdens in this world. You know what Jesus' burden is? It, it is light. Here's his burden. Love God, love others. That's a pretty easy burden. 
And you might be saying, you know, it's, it's pretty easy to love God, but loving others, I, I don't know. Look, I, I got this guy that I work with, and he's just a total jerk. I'm, seriously, I, there's no other way to say it. He's, he's horrible. I don't like this guy at all, and he's always out to get me. Or you might say, you know, I have this neighbor who just, again, just rubs me the wrong way. How do, I, how do I love them if I don't even like them? Well, Jesus says that, you know, you, you don't have to like them necessarily, I guess, but, but, but we do have to love them. So Jesus says, love them. And that's what we're supposed to do, guys. Because the more we learn from Christ, the more we become like Christ, and the more we're able to act like Christ. And so we can go to our neighbor and our coworker that, that we don't like, and we can love them, and we can pray for them. And then peacefulness will come in those situations. Jesus says just, guys, take my yoke. You know, come to me. Bring me your worst. Give me the worst that you have, and in return, I will give you rest. Take my yoke. Walk with me. Partner with me in this life in a, in a real sense and in a spiritual sense. And guys, and here's the deal. You will find rest for your soul. Now, guys, that's something no other rabbi could say. That's something no other teacher could say. Only Jesus could come out and say, rest for your souls, because he is Savior. He's the only one, guys. There were others who would say, come in this way, and you'll find rest from your burden, and rest from all these things. Jesus says, I will give you rest for your souls. Now, remember the original audience over here. Right? They're, they're, they're kind of tied down and worn down with the law. They're trying, to, they're trying to live it out, but it's just not happening. It's not working at all. And Jesus says, stop. Just stop. You're not going to find rest in that. It doesn't exist. It's not going to happen. You've got to get out of the old, and you've got to come into the new. New Testament. New era. New life. Because I am Savior, and I will give you life, and I will give you eternal life. Rest for your souls. Guys, listen, here's the deal. If you're here this morning and you don't have that kind of relationship with Jesus, if you don't know him that way as Savior, you just don't know the real Jesus, guys. And if that's the case, I want to help you make that right this morning. And so I'm going to come down to here. And as I come down here,